Hey guys, this is Josh here from Trillium Wild Edibles, and I want to welcome all of you to the seventh video field guide. In this video, we are going to cover seven wild edible and medicinal plants that you can find in places like your yard, in the woods, and other easily accessible places. We're going to go over each plant's identification features in depth and cover some of the uses of each one. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. This is a very easy plant to identify and it's a very commonly eaten plant all across the globe. This plant is extremely popular. Being a mustard species, there are hundreds and hundreds of mustard species all across the globe. And as we all know, they make things like canola oil, mustard, garlic mustard that I've talked about on my channel. There are so many awesome things that you can do with mustard species. So let's take a closer look at this plant in front of us and see how we can identify it. Whenever you find your winter crest greens in the early spring, like right now it's the middle of April or beginning of April, and we can see these four petaled yellow flowers. Flowers with four petals are generally speaking indicative of mustard species or mustard relatives. Now oftentimes in early spring, your winter crest is going to start flowering like we can see here. We can see these tightly packed flower buds with a few four petaled yellow colored flowers. We can also see these other little bitty flower buds and each one of these little flower buds will produce a four petaled yellow flower just like we can see right here. These flower buds are absolutely delicious if cooked just like broccoli before the flowers start to appear. On all these little buds where we see the flowers, we can actually just pick the flowers off and then go ahead and cook it like you would broccoli for a couple of minutes. Going down from the flower buds and the flower clusters on wintercress, we're going to notice that the upper leaves are clasping and they are lance shaped with very sharp tooth margins as we can see on this one right here. If we rotate this around, you can see what I mean by clasping where the leaf clasps the main stem, but this is only on the upper section of the plant. We can also notice this one right back over there. However, if we go down towards the bottom of the plant where the plant meets the soil, we're going to notice these compound leaves with these little bitty earlobe uh, like lobes actually that we can see here running along the base of the leaf stem towards the main stem. And as we get further out towards the end, we're going to notice a sort of lant shaped leaf with these sharply toothed margins, just like we can see on the upper clasping leaves. Now this plant has a couple different sets of leaves and we're going to look at the last set, which is the basal leaves or what forms the basal rosette that you would normally see during the late winter. Now as we go down towards the base of the plant, towards the basal rosette, we're going to notice the leaves get a lot more rounded in appearance and the upper part of the compound leaf will have smooth margins and we'll start to see these teeth develop towards the lateral base or the later end base of the leaf. And as we go further down, we're going to notice these lobes get far more sparsely populated and far more spaced out as we go down the leaf of the main stem of the plant at the basal rosette. By looking at these leaves, we can also notice that they are dark green and glossy in appearance. If we look at them on the side, we're going to notice that they are hairless. Some other mustard species that can look similar will have hairy leaves and they will not be glossy like this. They'll be dark, dull green instead of this bright, glossy, dark green that we see here with this specific leaf. Now, as we go up further from the basal rosette of the plant, we're going to notice these leaf shapes changing. So the leaf shape can be variable depending on which stage the plant is in and which portion of the plant you're looking at. As we can see here, these lobes towards the back of the leaf are a lot more closer to the top of the leaf. And we can see these sharp tooth margins starting towards the top and this lant shape appearance appearing on the very top of the leaf. If we look closely at the stem of wintercress, we're going to notice that it's actually rather stiff and almost square in feeling and appearance. It also has these unique ridges that we can see running vertical right now up and down throughout the camera frame. Wintercress is a very, very popular wild edible plant that's oftentimes eaten in late winter and throughout early spring. Throughout early spring, you can use 
these tight little flower buds, like I said earlier, uh, basically like you would broccoli. The leaves do become extremely bitter a little bit later on in the year, like this time when we start to see these flowers appearing. However, in late winter, uh, usually in my area, all the way up until around mid-March, these leaves are excellent, only boiled once, and you can actually even eat them raw if you add them to other greens in a salad. Oxide daisy is a very commonly found plant that's growing along wastelines, field lines, wasteland, and things like that. Well, notice these very bright, white, showy flowers with this very disc-like yellow center inside of it. And this is a good indication that we have a daisy species. So let's take a look at some of the closer identification features of this plant so we know what we're working with. If we look very closely at the top of the flowers of oxeye daisy, we're going to notice 20 to 30 of these ray-like petals emanating out from the center of the flower. If we turn it upside down, we're going to notice that the flower bracts are green with brown along the margins, just like we can see on the underside of this one here. Now, if we look very closely at the tip of each one of these petals on the flower, we're going to notice there is a little bit of a notch. It's a little hard to see because it is very small, but there is a little notch at the tip of each one of these flower petals. Oxide daisy really likes to grow in clearings on the edge of wood lines and on the edges of fields. It generally kind of likes what's considered more like wasteland. This is a plant that you can commonly find growing along roadsides too. It will normally grow about one to three feet in height. And the plants we're looking at are about three feet in height. You might find some a little above that and you might find some a little below that, but that's the general height that these plants will grow. As we can see, they tend to colonize and they tend to grow in small little groupings and clusters where we can see all these little white flower heads. This is a good indicator that we have a daisy or oxeye daisy. So let's take a closer look at the stem and the leaves of oxeye daisy. The leaves of oxeye daisy are variable in shape and size as we get towards the bottom or the top of the plant. Right now we are at the very ground or the basal rosette of the plant and we can notice that the leaves are almost spoon-like in shape and they do have very nice rounded lobes along the margins of the leaf. We can notice that they're scoop-like in shape, and we can also notice that the underside of them is somewhat similar in appearance to green in color as the top of them. Some plants are lighter on the top and some are lighter on the bottom. This one is a pretty even green all the way throughout. Now as we get further up the plant, we're going to notice that its leaves go from this oblong spoon-like shape into this very long linear shape. So let's take a look at some of the plant's leaves towards the top. Right here we can see one of the leaves towards the top, a little bit higher up. We are about halfway up the stem on this specific oxide daisy. And we can see that the leaves are not only shorter in length, the lobes actually get a little bit sharper. If I turn the leaf to the side a little bit, we can see how much more narrow it is, and it's almost linear in shape. We'll also notice that instead of having a leaf stem, the leaves clasp around the main stem of the plant. If we go towards the very back, where it clasps around the stem, we can notice these very sharply divided lobes right up against where the leaf stem of the plant rests. As we go from the very bottom of the plant towards the top, we're going to notice that the leaves alternate on which side of the stem they're going to appear from, but you can have multiple appearing from one node because each node will shoot out a stem. As we can see on the stem towards the left, we can actually see these leaves are alternating. We can see even better as well, the very sharp lobes or sharp teeth that they have around the margins or along the margins of these leaves. We'll also notice as we go further up the plant, we can see how much smaller these leaves get the further we go up. See, we're almost towards the top and see how tiny these leaves are in comparison towards the ones at the base of the plant. If we look at the stem of oxeye daisy, we're going to notice that it's basically just round in appearance. There's nothing terribly distinct or striking about the stem of this plant. Now if we look out, we can see that I'm basically on the edge of a field slash clearing. This is getting all rejuvenated with native hardwoods, 
But in the meantime, there are some field growing plants like our wonderful oxeye daisies growing there. And this is the type of environment that you're going to be finding your oxeye daisies growing in. Like I said earlier, this is a plant that can grow along the edges of wood lines. It can grow along roadsides and things like that. And it's a very commonly found plant that'll usually bloom from May all the way up until August, depending upon where you live. Oxide daisy is edible and medicinal. Its leaves and roots are used for coughs and colds and things like that. And its leaves, its young leaves, are usually eaten raw in salads or boiled as a pot herb in the early spring. The young shoots are also edible either raw or boiled, though some people prefer them to be cooked a little bit because they can be bitter for some people's taste. This plant can be made into tea. It can also be made into tincture, though it's more commonly used in tea, and that's usually the leaves and the root. Whenever you're digging the root of oxeye daisy, it's best to dig up the root in the fall after the first frost, like you would with any other medicinal root. So this is a very beautiful flower. It's a very awesome flower. However, it's also considered invasive in a lot of the places of the United States. So make sure you keep that in mind that while this is a beautiful plant, it's not a native plant and it is considered invasive. Jack in the pulpit is a very commonly found plant this time of year, especially while you're out morel hunting. This plant loves to grow in moist woodlands that you're probably going to be finding all of your morels in. As we can see here, this plant has a very unique shape to it, and there's more than just one plant here. This is one plant, that is one plant, and we can see a couple more individual plants coming up here. But right now, let's take a close look at the identification features of Jack in the Pulpit, so that way you guys know what you're getting yourselves into when you see this plant. Now as we can see when Jack in the Pulpit is growing at this stage, we're going to notice a trifoliate leaf pattern. Each one of these leaves is going to be ovate shaped and they're going to be smooth along the margins. We're also going to notice these very distinct veins that are running laterally to each other at sort of a 45 degree angle from the mid vein of each leaf. And as we can see on each one of these leaves, that is the case. The top of the leaf is going to be darker green versus the underside of the leaf, as we can see here, is going to be a little bit lighter and sort of a gray color in appearance. Each one of these leaves is going to converge at the top of the plant stem, just like we can see right here where they all converge and meet up. Here we can see the main stem of the plant, and then over here is the very top of what's known as the pulpit. So let's take a close look at the pulpit or the flower of Jack in the Pulpit. Now whenever we're looking at the pulpit of Jack in the Pulpit, this is technically and botanically known as a spathe. Inside of it, if we open up this top leaf or this hood, we can actually see there's a spadix inside. The flowers are down there in the very bottom and those kind of brownish red sort of little inflorescence that are at the very bottom. This is part of this plant's reproductive strategy, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. If we put the top of the hood back over and we turn it back, we can see this very unique cup-like shape with this distinct hood over top. Whenever we're looking at the spadix of Jack in the Pulpit, we can notice these whiter striations with these purplish brown tinging in between them. As this matures, it will actually turn more brown in appearance where these purple tinges are in between these white striations. Now after the plant is pollinated and it comes to fruit, it does produce a cluster of berries that some people confuse with ginseng berries. Plus ginseng looks a lot more unique and has a palmate leaf structure versus a trifoliate leaf structure like Jack in the Pulpit. As we noticed earlier, here comes the sun, as we noticed earlier, the inside of that hood is going to be a purple color. You're going to have purple and green, and sometimes this can be brown in appearance as well. As we look inside, we can see the spadix right there coming up through the center, looking sort of phallic. And then down deeper, we can see all those little bitty inflorence inflorescences. I know this is difficult to see. I can't really get this to focus anymore just because of the depth of field 
of this plant. Jack in the pulpit, as we can see, is a very unique plant and it grows from what's called a corm. If we're looking inside, at the inside of the flower, all those little inflorescences attract its pollinators. It's pollinated by fungus gnats. The fungus gnats are attracted to the very rancid smell of the inflorescence inside of the spathe and then they get trapped in because of this hood. On each flower, there is male and female inflorescences or male and female flowers. The male flowers will usually die off before the females have had a chance to grow. This plant will grow from what's known as a corm. Spring beauty also grows from what's known as a corm. The corm of this plant is what's edible. However, it requires extremely, extremely cautious preparation. <clears throat> All of the plant's parts are very high in oxalic acid and oxalate crystals. These will cause a deep burning sensation in the mouth and the throat and on the skin where the plant juice has gotten on your skin. This is a plant that's best observed from a distance, observe its uniqueness, and observe its beauty. This plant, as we can see, also likes to grow in clusters or groups or small colonies. Whenever they're coming up and they're very, very young, we're going to see just these three leaves that we can see back here. This makes some people confuse this plant with poison ivy because they both have a trifoliate leaf pattern. Poison ivy looks very, very different, and I have an identification video of poison ivy on my channel if you guys are interested. So let's take a look at some of the younger jack-in-the-pulpit plants and see what they look like in comparison to our more matured Jack in the pulpit plants right here. As we can see, this little bitty trifoliate guy coming up here, this is a young Jack in the pulpit. And this is what they look like as they're coming up, which I assume causes people to confuse this with poison ivy. As we can see, it looks very different, and the leaves wrap around the stem and they come up in a folded sort of pattern. And as the plant matures over time, those leaves will spread out to look like the more mature ones we just took a look at. So as you guys can see, Jack in the Pulpit is a very easy plant to identify. It's extremely unique and there isn't anything else like it in the Eastern Woodlands. Now this plant is native to the Eastern Woodlands and it can be found all the way through Canada on the Eastern coast, all the way over towards the Mississippi River area, north up into Canada, all the way down through Florida. So if you live in the eastern United States, there's a good chance you're running across Jack in the Pulpit in the woods. This is a very, very common plant that's found in lawns and around gardens, old barns, sidewalks, um, landscaping areas, and all kinds of other places like that. <clears throat> This plant generally grows throughout the early and middle to late spring. We are, right now it's uh, beginning of April, and as we can see, this hen bit is really blooming very well with these very small but beautiful purple to violet colored flowers. So let's take a closer look at how to identify this guy. The very first thing that you're probably going to notice with it is these very beautiful but small purple to violet colored flowers, and there's usually going to be a whole lot of them on the plant, as we can see on this one here, there's just a whole lot right there. Sorry, I grabbed the wrong plant by accident. <clears throat> as we can see, there is a whole lot of them here. Now these flowers will come out of the leaf axles of the plant, and they will come out of almost every one of the leaf axles past a certain point. I don't notice them too deep in the base towards the plant, <clears throat> but I do notice them coming up a lot more towards the top uh, of the plant. If we take a closer look at this plant, we're going to notice these very purple, violet colored flowers, and we can see there's going to be quite a bit of them. And we'll also notice how they come out of the leaf axles towards the base of the stem. As we can see, whoops, as we can see right here on this one. These flowers are going to be tubular in shape, and we're going to see two curved uh, lips on the petals, on the bottom petals, just like we can see right above my middle finger here on this plant. If we look at this plant from a side view, we're going to notice what I was talking about earlier and how these flowers will come out of the leaf axles or the leaf nodes all the way up and down the plant. However, I don't notice them towards the bottom of the plant near the base of the ground as I do on the top. So let's take a look. So as we go down the stem, we can notice the base of the plant here and notice that there 
aren't any flowers coming out of these leaf nodes here. And this is right uh, what would have been at the soil level. If we look at the leaves from a top view, we're going to notice they're kind of round, a kidney shaped, but they have these very deeply scalloped edges. And if we also look closely at the underside of the stem where the leaves meet the main stem, we'll notice that they clasp around the main stem. So these are clasping leaves and they grow in an opposite pattern, meaning they grow on opposite sides of the stem. And they also clasp, just like we can see here from this really good under view. Another unique thing about this plant is it is in the mint family. And like most of your other mints, it will have a square stem, just like we can see right here on this one. This very unique square stem is indicative of a mint species. Not all mints will have a square stem, and not every plant with a square stem is a mint. But a good general rule of thumb is that if it has a square stem, it's most likely a mint species. And as we can see, this hen bit is really blooming very well with these very small but beautiful purple to violet colored flowers. But I find that in my experience it tends to really like the edges of houses, garages, sheds, barns, the edges of your garden, uh, anywhere where you might have landscaping, you're definitely going to be finding this around the edges of it. And I oftentimes find it in companionship with chickweed. There is a lot of common chickweed growing right here amongst this hen bit along the side of my house. So this is a really good way to find it. It's a very easy plant to identify. It's a very easy plant to find. It sticks out like a sore thumb uh, this time of year because those big clusters of purple flowers. And if we look at some of these, we can notice there are quite a bit of flowers on all of these. Uh, this plant will spread out uh, by root by running root runners and it will go and further colonize an area and take over by spreading out So it can be troublesome and it is considered invasive in a lot of places So make sure you do some research on that While this plant is edible and medicinal. I'm not going to be talking about any of the uses of that today just simply because this is an identification video, but it does have edible uses and it does have medicinal uses However, I will note if you plan on using it medicinally or edibly, you should keep in mind that in some cases people have reported um, swelling of the throat and trouble and difficulty breathing. And those symptoms have abated or gone away within about a 24 hour period. Uh, not everybody who consumes this plant gets that reaction. So please be very, very careful about consuming this plant. If you're aware that you're allergic to it, don't use it. If you think you might be allergic to it, it's probably a good idea to stay away from it or use a very, very small amount to see if you get any of those uh, bad side effects or bad symptoms. This plant, known as common ragweed, is extremely notorious for causing hay fever allergies within people who are susceptible to the pollen of this plant. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Common ragweed does not grow as tall as its cousin or relative known as giant ragweed. However, it does have some similar features, mainly these big long flower spikes that we see coming out of the top of the plant on all of these different little branches. We can see all of these spikes are the flower spikes. Now these spikes are also what contain the pollen in male plants. The male flowers and the male plants distribute the pollen and pollinate the females, which then creates the seed. This plant generally spreads by rhizome, though it can spread by seed. Giant ragweed, however, will spread more by seed and a little bit less by rhizome. However, they both spread somewhat similarly by rhizome and seed. That's something to keep in mind, especially if you see a whole lot of this plant around, because you'll notice a lot more of it growing in the area or surrounding it. So let's take a close look at the leaves and the stem of common ragweed. Whenever we look at the leaves of common ragweed, we're going to notice that they are compound in shape, but they are pinnately compound, or what's known as pinnate leaves. The reason for that is all of these different little branches or little extra little bits of leaves all the way around on the side here. Notice how it's very finely separated. And if we look even closer at the leaf, we'll notice how if we follow the main vein of the leaf upwards, we're going to see that the leaf 
actually goes all the way around this mid vein here in the center. If we look closely at each one of these pinnate divisions, we're going to notice how the teeth are opposite and alternate. Like we can see on this one here, the divisions on the margins are actually a lot more alternating versus if we look at this one here, they look a little more opposite, but they still alternate. If we look at the underside of the leaf, we're going to notice that it is a lot lighter in color of a green than the top side of the leaf. Another thing that we're going to notice about the leaf stem, if we look at the underside, is there are going to be very small and fine bristles and hairs. They may be kind of hard to see, but you should be able to see them up against this black dark background that we have here. Also, while we're looking at the underside of the leaf, it's a little easier to see this alternating pattern between the pinnate divisions along this entire leaf. These aren't leaflets, they are one whole leaf. If we look at the stem of common ragweed, we're also going to notice that the stem itself is covered in a lot of those also fine bristles and hairs, this white sort of fuzz all the way up and down the stem. Whenever we look at the leaf stem that's coming out of the main stem of the plant, like we can see here, we'll notice it's also white and fuzzy, but it also has this purple coloration and this purple tinging going along the top side of it. This is a really good way with all these different factors to help identify your common ragweed. And there are a few plants that can kind of look similar within the Eastern US, but not very many. However, this coloration on the leaf stem that we see right here is a really, really good feature to pay attention to in consideration with the rest of the things we've talked about thus far. Whenever we look at the main stem of common ragweed, there is some variability between this alternating and opposite pattern. For example, on this plant, we can actually see that these branching stems are on opposite sides. And it goes like this on this particular one all the way up until we get towards the top third of the plant. And then we start to notice that the stems actually alternate, the leaf stems alternate on each side of the main stem of the plant. While we're looking at the main stem of common ragweed, once we get towards the top, we'll notice all these fine bristles and hairs get a lot more dense and a lot more thick towards the top of the plant versus the further we go down, the less prominent that these hairs become. Note that they're still there, but if we compare sides, look how fuzzy that is towards the top to how it is towards the bottom. That's another interesting feature of these plant. Now a cool thing is that these hairs don't sting, they don't itch, and they don't cause any irritation. But they are there and they are an important feature to consider. The stem of the plant is round and rather indistinct beyond the rest of everything else we just covered about the stem. Here we can see the underside of the leaf stem and how it is green versus if we look at the top of it, we can see this purplish red brown sort of coloration that it has. So now let's take a look at the flower structure and the flowers of common ragweed. If we look at the flowers of common ragweed, which are going to be on the top of the plant, and the plant will produce multiple flowers. If we look at the flower spikes of this plant, we're going to notice this yellowish green sort of appearance. And like I said earlier, this is where your pollen is going to be coming from. This is the pollen that can cause your hay fever and your allergies, especially in the summertime, if you're very sensitive to the pollen of this plant. These cylindrical spikes of flowers are also going to be producing the pollen and the seeds, whether it's a male or female plant. Each plant can produce anywhere from 15,000 to 25,000 or more seeds, so it can spread rather prolifically, and that's something that you need to keep in mind. Whenever we look at the top of common ragweed, we're going to notice all of these cylindrical spikes. Now each branching node at the top of the plant can produce a flower spike. Um, that's an interesting thing about this plant is all of these huge flower spikes are all on just one plant. And with the rest of the plants growing around it because it spreads by rhizomes, 
That means this can be male, the next one can be female, and they closely pollinate, then go to seed. And that is part of this plant's reproduction strategy and part of its survival strategy, so that way it continues to live. As we're looking in front of us, we can see multiple common ragweed plants. And again, this is how this plant usually works. You're going to be finding it in small clusters or in small colonies because of its reproductive strategy. Common ragweed usually likes to grow on the edges of fields, clearings, wood lines, lawns, gardens, driveways. This guy will pretty much grow anywhere there's soil and there's enough sunlight for it to grow. The area this is in right now receives about three hours of sunlight a day and it's growing just fine. So it's not too picky on its environment, nor is it picky on soil or sunlight. That's another thing to keep in mind, especially if you're seeing this plant in your yard or your garden and you're highly allergic to its pollen. Common ragweed can usually grow anywhere from two feet tall all the way up to three, in some cases three and a half feet tall if we go to the top of these flower spikes. As we can see right here on the edge of my backyard, there is quite a bit of common ragweed. That purple flower off to the back is ironweed, another plant that I've done an identification video on if you're interested. But this kind of shows the nature of its growth pattern and its colonization strategy that this plant has. This plant is in no way, shape, or form the same thing as poison sumac. So make sure you guys keep that in mind. There is another very popular sumac species known as staghorn sumac, wing sumac, staghorn sumac, and there's another one known as smooth sumac. All three of those are edible, and they do uh, actually look a lot alike. Now this cluster that we're seeing in front of us right here is actually the flowers of the winged sumac. So let's take a close look at this. As we can see, this is a very, very dense flower cluster. And we can see, if we look closely, we can see these little yellow bits of flowers. And you're going to see all kinds of little bitty bees and wasps and things all over this because it's uh, pollinating right now. But right here you guys can see those little yellow flowers coming up. And this is the flowers of the winged sumac. I would get closer, however, there's a big drop off right in front of me. So I'm not able to actually get too up close to this portion of it right now because well, it's about three foot of a drop and I wouldn't be able to reach it. <laughs> now, oftentimes whenever people are out walking in the woods this time of year and they see the very indicative sumac leaves that we can see hanging off here in this white cluster, they assume that this is poison sumac. And that is not true. This is a very delicious and highly rated edible species. After these flowers come on and they get pollinated, it will start to produce a fruit. And these fruits are little red berries, little tiny red berries, probably around an eighth to a quarter of an inch in size. They are covered in a lot of very small hairs, and it does make a very delicious pink lemonade sort of flavored drink. However, because of those hairs, you do have to strain those hairs out with a coffee filter or a very fine cheesecloth multiple times to get those hairs out because they are irritating. But let's take a look at the leaves here, shall we? Right here we can see the leaves of this winged sumac, and if you look closely we're going to notice that there are actually 11 of these leaves or leaflets all together along this stem. And each one is going to have anywhere from 10 to 11 of these leaves on opposite sides, so it has opposite leaf pattern. These leaves are going to be smooth along the margins, just like we can see here. The underside is going to be a little bit lighter, while the top is going to be this dark green. And you're even going to see some red and purple tingings. Now it's called wing sumac because if we look down the meristem here, we're going to see these basically little leaf-like structures, these little wing-like structures here all the way down the meristem where these little leaflets are coming out. The closer we get down to where all these branches are coming out, we're going to notice this pinkish red tinging. And this part is actually very, very soft and smooth. If I can get a close look at it here. There you go, you guys should be able to see it's got like these little fine hairs or this little bloom-like substance all over and it makes it feel really soft and velvety. So this is a couple of the ways that you can identify winged sumac really easily in the field. If we take a step back, we can see all of these flower clusters all along this tree. Now this is actually a rather short one. This tree can get anywhere from 10 to 30 feet in height. This one looks like it's probably around 12 feet in height at this top. But there is another one 
that we can see right over there. And that one actually goes up to about 20 and 25 feet in height. Now you're commonly going to be finding your sumac along areas like this on the edge of clearings or on the edge of wood lines where they get a lot of sunlight. You can find them along the edges of fields, along the edges of roadsides, and uh, a lot of other places like that. So those are the type of areas you want to be looking for your sumac. And that'll uh, be the same for your wing sumac, your smooth sumac, and your staghorn sumac. This is a really easy plant to identify, like I said, a really quick little identification video here because there's really not a lot to talk about when it comes to this plant. Well, at least not right now until the uh, berries are in season and we can harvest the berries. Now, after these fruits get bleh, now after these flowers get pollinated, uh, the fruits will start coming in at around the uh, beginning to middle of September, and they're usually good to harvest around up until August, in some cases November. But you want to get them before heavy rains wash out all of the flavor and antioxidants out of these berries. But well, we can see right there honeybee doing its thing. There's a lot of honeybees and uh, other types of various bee species and presumably some wasp species as well that are all over this guy. But just so you guys know, whenever you see this and you look at it closely, you can tell that it is not poison sumac because it has those wings. It's also important to look at the area you live in because where I live, Poison sumac is extremely rare in my portion of Indiana. This is a very prevalent plant that you're going to find growing along roadsides. So let's take a quick look at some of the identification features of this plant. First and foremost, what you're going to notice is these very, very striking light blue and indigo colored flowers with multiple petals. Anywhere from 10 to 15 petals on each flower is one of the biggest things you're going to notice. Another thing that we're going to notice is all these little ridges, little indentions that we can see along the top of each one of the petals of these flowers. So let's take a close look at these. Right here we can really see all these little indentions and notice how they are on the top of every single flower petal here. Every flower petal has these. Now some people will confuse these flowers with uh, blue lettuce, but the thing is, not only does this plant grow much shorter than blue lettuce, its flowers are actually much, much larger than blue lettuce. Blue lettuce flowers are about the size of my thumbnail, versus you can see this is definitely much bigger than my thumbnail. That's one of the easy ways to tell these apart by the flowers. So let's take a quick look at some of the leaves of this plant. If we go down from the top of the chicory plant, we're going to notice these very, very small lance-shaped leaves. However, if we go further down the plant, we're going to notice the leaves actually get a little bit bigger. We can see that leaf right there, and we can see that it's much bigger, but it still retains the same shape. Another thing we're going to notice is that the leaves will actually alternate, just like we can see, these leaves will alternate going down the stem. We're going to notice that the leaves will get bigger. This one is starting to die off a little bit. Uh, this plant really loves to grow along roadsides, so it is subject to pollution sometimes. Um, I don't know what's causing this one, but we can see the margins of the leaves here actually have these teeth and serrations running along the side of the leaves. These leaves are very stiff to the feel. The top is going to be a green, and the bottom is going to be a similar color or shade of green as well. But we'll notice just how much bigger this leaf is in comparison to the first couple that we just looked at. Now right here towards the base of the plant, this is probably about three or four inches up from the soil level, and we can notice this huge cluster of leaves where this is all branched off here, and we can even see some uh, old flower pods coming out of this here. But we're going to notice that the leaves not only get bigger, but they get rounder towards the tip. They're not near as lance-shaped and they will start to develop teeth along the margins of them the further we go down the plant. Now, like I said, the basal rosette is not here this time of year. That is an early spring uh, type of the leaf that you're going to find on chicory. Now, the leaves of this plant can be eaten, and they're actually extremely delicious, and the root of this plant can also be eaten. If we look closely at some of the leaves that are going to be down at the ground level, I actually got lucky and just found one here. We're going to notice that they look almost kind of like dandelion leaves a little bit, but they're much smaller and much more narrow than dandelion leaves. But we can notice these lobes and teeth running along the margins here. If we flip it over, we're going to notice that the green is pretty similar on both sides, the top and the bottom side of the leaf. 
And this is basically going to be the shape of the leaves on the basal rosette of the plant that you're going to find in the early spring. And these things are amazing cooked up green, just like you would cook up like spinach or, or kale or chard or anything like that. They're absolutely delicious. Whenever you look at the stem of chicory, you're not going to notice anything terribly distinct about it. It is basically just round in appearance and feel and texture. It's actually rather tough and kind of woody. So it does have a really tough stem, but we can see these old flower clusters, these old flower buds alternating just like the leaves do going up and down the main stem of the plant. Now a lot of the places you're going to be finding your chicory is actually on the side of roads and you can notice it because throughout its blooming season, which is usually anywhere from the middle of summer all the way until the middle of fall, actually, and I've even seen this plant bloom in uh, the middle of winter during certain weather conditions where it just gets warm enough for this plant to bloom. This is an extremely hardy plant, but it loves to grow along edges of highways and roadsides. So you do have to be careful whenever you're foraging it to make sure that you're not getting any excess pollution or even pla or, uh, in places where they spray uh, herbicides. You want to make sure that you're not consuming any of that when you do forage this plant. Another thing to look out for because it grows on roadsides is don't get hit by traffic, whatever you do. Right now I'm on a backcountry road. I've been here for about 20 minutes and I've only seen one car. So this is a pretty safe spot for me to be filming this. But this will give you guys an idea of how close to the road I am. That right there is the roadside. And this is where you're going to be finding your chicory. If we come and look down here, we're going to notice we can see more of these chicory flowers growing all along the road. We can see some over there. And if we look back over here, Hold on a minute, let me uh, adjust my ISO some. There we go, if we look down over there, we can see some more of this chicory. So this is very indicative of the habitat of chicory. So that concludes the seventh video field guide to wild edibles and medicinal plants. I hope all of you guys enjoyed this video and I hope you guys learned something. If you wanna learn more about wild edibles or medicinal plants, please make sure